Right, well, we've got 12 o'clock, so um, we'll do a little bit of a kind of overview of the series here, and then we'll um, get started as people still continue to um, trickle in and join us here today. Um, so first of all, just a couple kind of um, housekeeping uh, rules, I guess, for how the webinar will run here for the next few weeks. Um, we do encourage you to send in questions for our speaker today through the um, question and answer pod. When you send those in, um, send them privately in and uh, they'll come just to me and then we will um, ask those questions to our presenter um, and we won't share your name with everybody. So just to give you an opportunity to ask whatever questions um, you might have without um, kind of any judgment or concern about what others might think of asking that question. So we have that um, option available to you as well. I think today we're gonna to primarily handle questions at the end of the talk, but please send them in as we're going along and then um, I'll kind of get them queued up so when we get to the end, I'm ready and maybe can even, if we've got several similar questions, I might lump them together um, so that we can get kind of through several different topics um, before the end of our time um, today. So that's how we'll handle um, kind of the questions. Um, now, just a kind of a quick reminder about the rest of the series before we focus on today. Um, so this series, this is the first in our session here, COVID-19 Conversations with Montana Experts. Um, when within extension, one of the things we kind of looked at is there's a lot of information about coronavirus out there. Where could we add some value? And one of the um, kind of things that we landed on is there's a lot of really great research and researchers going on um, right here in the state of Montana. So this series is going to give an opportunity for some of those folks um, to share directly with you about their area of expertise around whether it be vaccines or viruses um, or even public policy aspects of this. So. Um, Two weeks from today, um, we're gonna have uh, Dr. Mariana Carrera, who's a healthcare economist in my department here at Montana State University. And she's gonna talk about the economics of vaccine um, subsidies, incentives, and policies. Um, four weeks from the day, today, we're gonna have Dr. Chris Nero, um, who's head of the, um, who works at Bozeman Health, and he's a pathologist. And he's gonna talk about um, COVID-19 and labs and kind of how those um, pieces fit together. And then our final one um, for December, on December 14th, will be um, Dr. Sophia Newcomer from the University of Montana. And she's gonna talk about identifying and addressing barriers to child um, and adolescent vaccination in Montana. So I'm really excited that um, we've got um, not just four great speakers, but we've got four different um, employers or institutions represented as well. So we've got the University of Montana, Montana State University, Bozeman Health, and today's speaker is going to be um, from Rocky Mountain Labs in Hamilton. So without further ado on that aspect, let me introduce today's speaker and then um, I will kind of step back and let Andrea take over. But um, Dr. Andrea Marzi received her PhD in virology from the Friedrich Alexander University in Nuremberg, Germany, where she studied the glycoprotein mediated entry of Ebola virus and HIV, which for me, just saying it is about as much as I know about those words. So I'm glad that um, Andrea can address those a little further. After her PhD, um, worked in Winnipeg, Canada um, with Dr. Heinz Feldman's group at their National Microbiology Laboratory, part of the Public Health Agency in Canada, and worked there with BSL-4 Laboratory on filoviruses and Ebola virus um, and vaccines as well. And then in 2008, um, she came to Montana and joined Rocky Mountain Labs in Hamilton, which is part of the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, in 2019, she was um, selected as an NIH Distinguished Scholar and is also a tenure track um, investigator there as well. So her research um, focuses on vaccine development for highly pathogenic viruses, including SARS-CoV-2. So with that, Andrea, I'm gonna turn it over to you and you can correct my errors in the medical terminology there that I um, probably stumbled through, so. Thank you, Joel. Um, thanks for having me today and you did just fine. So no worries there. <laughs> So, um, good afternoon. Um, um, as Joel alluded to, I have been working in Montana at the Rocky Mountain Labs for over a decade. And one of the main focuses of my research then, as well as now continuing with Ebola virus, but also with SARS-CoV-2 is vaccines. And um, 
as Joel also said, I'm not originally from here. So if I sound in some pronunciation words here a little bit funny, it's because I grew up in Germany, specifically just a little bit north of Munich. And I had a really awesome biology teacher in fifth grade who got me super interested in microbes and the fact that they're all around us and that some of us, some of them are really good for us and others are really bad and can kill us. And so I got really interested in microbiology and then in 10th grade, um, we had um, classes on HIV and you know, all those other diseases caused by deadly viruses that are no cures for. And that's what really sparked my interest and it became a career path for me. So viruses are special to me because they are actually not of part of the tree of life. The tree of life is shown here and it really contains all the bacteria, fungi, plants, mammals, everything except for viruses because viruses always need a host. They cannot replicate or propagate themselves. So um, they are different. And so some of us do not even consider them living. Um, and that's you know a completely different philosophical question. But for me, this has been really a driving factor for um, a career path. So viruses have led me to the, this awesome BSO4 facility here at the Integrated Research Facility at Rocky Mountain Labs. Some of you living around here might have seen um, this building from outside the fence. And it's housing the BSO4, which is also not just like, you know, biosafety level four, but it's also referred to as maximum containment laboratory because it is, um, con like we can work with viruses in there, but there's no treatment, no vaccines, and that would spread very efficiently from person to person. So we are protected working in this shiny space. This picture was taken back in 2008 when it was brand new. And this is what we look like when we work in there. So we are breathing um, air that is coming into the suit supplied by this red curled up air hose. And you can see in the lab over here that um, every few yards, there is one airdrop coming from the ceiling supplying us with air. So we are really completely out of touch with our environment. So that's really good. And we're wearing a positive pressure suit. So should we, you know, everything else is negative. So um, really super good protected. I brought a short video for you guys to look at um, just to get an idea what it's like to be in there, how we work in there, and I will talk you through it. So we are located in Hamilton, which is on the west side of this beautiful state in a bit of valley. So we have mountains around us and it's really awesome. Um, as I said, the um, lab is located in this new building that was opened in 2008 when we moved in. On the left side here is the BSO4 tract where we go in. So the procedure of entering is you are taking off your clothes, all your clothes, you're going into scrubs, and then you get into your suit. In order to do that, you have to perform once a week a suit check where we replace those rubber gloves on the suit. Everything else is pretty sturdy plastic or clear plastic in the face. Um, of the suit, but in order to have some kind of dexterity, we use these rubber gloves and we change them every week because they are um, our weak point there because, as I said, everything else is much sturdier plastic. So we put on gloves, two pairs of gloves of the purple ones underneath the suit glove and then go into the suit. So we have in the end three pairs of gloves on and it's different to touch and work with things than was just normally in the lab. We enter the lab, as I said before, we are always moving from airdrop to airdrop to supply ourselves with air. And then we work um, in biosafety cabinets. So all viruses are handled in the lab side in these biosafety cabinets. So we are additionally protected. All the waste is discarded as shown here in those big yellow buckets. So there is disinfectant in there and they remain overnight in the cabinet. So there is um, an additional layer of safety there. 
everything we do is um, in the suit and it's actually sometimes quite cumbersome because you carry this plastic bubble around with you. So we have a time limit. We can only be in there for five hours max, which is good because of five, after five hours of not drinking and eating and going to the bathroom, we really need a break. Um, here is um, shown how we store our viruses. They are in extreme cold and only a handful of people actually have access to this room. Not even I do. We always have to request them when we work. When we're done with our work, we secure everything, de decontaminate everything, including ourselves. So we come out through a chemical shower, which is three minutes of chemical spray and then three minutes of water rinse. And then we are required to take a personal shower, including hair washing. And um, yeah, so, you know, against the general belief that we are working with dirty bugs and our dirty people, we actually shower a lot and are uh, considerably clean. So what RML here works on are infectious diseases from bacteria to viruses, um, coxiella to tularemia, and, uh, MRSA, and then viruses. In the BSO4, we handle viruses. And one of the major objectives is to first find out how these viruses make humans sick and then to develop prevention or treatment strategies. So the two major aspects of our work here are A, treatments, which are applied to people after they get sick. And one of the best examples for that is actually antibiotics against bacteria. Another big approach that we are researching here are preventatives. And preventatives are given to people before they get sick or might have exposures to bacteria or viruses. And the best example for those are obviously vaccines. So I want to start with introducing you to, in general, what is a vaccine? And if you look in a dictionary or textbook, a vaccine is defined as a biologic preparation that induces immunity against an infectious disease. And the first vaccine that was ever developed actually ended up to be so far also our only vaccine success story in the world, and that was smallpox. So vaccines or the concept of vaccination was introduced and discovered by Edward Jenner in, seven, in the 1790s in England. He noticed um, in times of smallpox, which causes shown down here in this person, these postules on a person's skin, he noticed that when there was a smallpox outbreak in the village, the milkmaids did not get sick. And he was very observant and noticed that the milkmaids were handling the cows that had also a disease called cowpox, and there they had those postules on the others. So when the milkmaids milked the cows, they got in touch with it. And so he thought, huh, maybe for them to having touched these, the pus from these postules, it gives them an advantage and then they don't get smallpox. So he actually did um, an experiment in 1796 when he used some pus from cowpox um, infected cow udder and put it in the arm of uh, the son of his gardener and then a few weeks later infected that child with smallpox and the boy did not develop disease. So Jenna saw proof my concept. He repeated this experiment on 23 more people and they all lived. So this was really the first experiment that thankfully worked to show that a less infectious preparation of a, a virus or bacteria can actually stimulate an immune response that then protects against the infection with the real thing. In this case, smallpox, uh, cowpox vaccination prevented smallpox infection. This was su such a uh, successful strategy that in 1840 in Britain, the Vaccination Act came through and free vaccination using cowpox was um, offered to everybody in Britain. And not only did Britain master smallpox, but also the entire world did. 
because the World Health Organization, WHO, promoted vaccination campaigns to eradicate smallpox from this world, and it was successfully done in 1980. And you can see here in this world map from the CDC homepage that as starting in the 1950s and 70s, there were really almost no cases of this deadly disease um, in the world anymore. So this is the only success story we have. We have made great strides eradicating other viruses and diseases from the earth, but we have had setbacks in recent years and have not gotten there yet. But this is really um, a great way to start introducing vaccines in general to you. So there is three traditional kinds of vaccines that have been used for the last decades, like since the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and even before to vaccinate people. And the first one is actually very similar to what I've just shown you with smallpox, where cowpox was used. And it's what we call in the research terms, a life attenuated vaccine. So this vaccine is based on the actual infectious agent. And as I said, for smallpox, it was a cowpox virus versus protective than in smallpox. For measles virus, it's a little bit different. So the scientists here took a measles virus that they isolated from a person and took it in cell culture in the laboratory. And there they passaged it many, many, many times, hundreds of times. And what happens is that through this passaging, the virus adapts like it gets used to this cell culture and not being in a human, and it loses its infectivity. It is what we call attenuated or weakened, and that is a vaccine. This virus still replicates, but it's not able to cause disease in humans anymore. And this is actually today still used against measles for measles vaccination as part of the MMR vaccine. The second kind of vaccine that we have around is an inactivated or killed vaccine. And a prominent example for that are obviously influenza virus A, we get a flu shot every, every season, or polio as well. Hepatitis A is another one. And what the scientists have done here is they're growing up the virus, like making large batches of it in a laboratory and then exposing it to chemicals and that also inactivates or um, kills the virus's infectivity without damaging it too much. So it still can trigger an immune response that is protective against infection. So in this case, influenza virus is generated in a laboratory, exposed to the chemical, and then purified. So the chemical is gone from the vaccine preparation. And then you have this killed virus vaccine that we get every year for the flu shot. A third and a little bit more, you know, like um, advanced vaccine that we have been using for a long time also is a so-called subunit vaccine. For this one, the scientists are not using the entire virus particle. They're just using one little part of the virus. And this has been used for shingles as well as hepatitis B vaccination. And in case of hepatitis B, the scientists learned that the body doesn't need to see the entire virus. It's sufficient if the body sees only this protein here that's on the surface. And if they make that in the laboratory synthetically, then, and then, uh, formulated into a vaccine, then the person that gets vaccinated is protected against hepatitis B virus. So this was the first time when, you know, like a moving away from the actual virus particle vaccine um, has been widely used. Today, we have a lot of vaccines that are approved by the US Food and Drug Administration or short FDA. And I'm sure with the news about COVID and everything, all of you have heard this term. And that is really the regulatory agency in the United States um, approving the use of any drug, including vaccines. 
And you can see here on this list that there is quite a few that we have and are regularly been using against viruses on the left and bacteria on the right. And these are mainly based on these three categories that I have introduced. So other categories or platforms for vaccine development have been um, researched and really successfully used for other viruses um, by companies for the last few decades. However, none of these companies making these vaccines um, are really interested in changing because it's like their um, way of making revenue every year. So that's why even some safer approaches might be out there now have not been really um, proceeded. So, and then came COVID-19 and the landscape changed a bit. Because never before was there so much money and so little time available to get something done. So people really worked together and got it all done. So COVID-19, the causative agent is SARS coronavirus 2. And SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, um, which is the real bad disease, um, its official term in the lungs that people develop. For the virology nerds among you, it is a positive single-stranded RNA virus, and its genome is about 30,000 base pairs. So the genome, every virus, you know, the particle is shown here in red, and every genome contains all the components that a virus is um, made of. It contains the genetic information for it. So for SARS, these are 20 some proteins that the genome encodes, and they're all produced in the infected cell and then in the infected body. So when your body gets infected, um, you make all these proteins and assemble virus particles. And what I really want to point out here is that the spike protein, which is mainly used for all vaccines these days that we are getting, is only 3,800 base pairs big. So it's nowhere close to being the size of the virus. It's only 13% of the viral genome. So if you think when you get vaccinated, you're getting the virus, it's just not true because you, in your vaccine, there's only that much of the viral genomic information present. So COVID-19 vaccines have been in the news and um, there have been different ones developed and that was also needed because every demographic group have different needs. So we need super safe ones for children and elderly versus you know some that are maybe working a little bit more quickly um, as a single shows for healthy adults. At this point in the United States, we have two mRNA-based vaccines and one viral vector vaccine approved for human use in the US here. And um, two are under emergency use authorization, whereas the Pfizer one is now fully approved. And I forgot to update the slide here, so my apologies. However, that's only in the United States. Worldwide, there is 85 more vaccines that are in clinical trials and even 100 more that are in preclinical evaluation and that is animal studies to check for if they're even eliciting or like generating an immune response or are protective against challenge. And that is mainly done in animal studies like hamsters for SARS-CoV-2. A closer look at the approved COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, though. Um, so the first one I want to introduce is um, from Pfizer Moderna mRNA. As I said, this vaccine only uses the spike genetic information, and the spike protein is the protein that's protruding, protruding from the virus particle. So it's really the one protein making contact with your body cells. And however, when you use mRNA, it's very instable. It will be degraded very quickly in the environment. So the scientists teamed up with some really um, cool biotechnologist people, and they came up with embedding 
the spike protein mRNA in lipid nanoparticles. So they basically just use what they make in the laboratory on mRNA and put it in an emulsion. It's like a fatty little droplet, if you want to envision it like that. And that is stable at low temperatures and then is um, thought and can be administered within a few hours into people's arms. So this is really cool. Um, safe. There is no, you know, production in cell lines or embryo cells, all of this involved and, um, rather safe. And that's why it was 1 of the 1st ones that received emergency use authorization from the FDA. And how this works is when you get the injection of this vaccine into your arm, the lipid nanoparticles fuse with your cells as is shown here and the mRNA is released into your cell. In your cell then the mRNA docks on ribosomes and the spike protein is made. And then because it's the spike protein it's normally presented on the surface of a virus it goes here to the surface of your cell which is a similar component. And so your body's immune cells then see that there is a protein presented that is not an own one from your body, but foreign one, and it recognizes it. So your immune cells, your white blood cells, everything, T cells goes and inspects it and generates an immune response. So you get what we call antigen specific T cells or B cells and the B cells then make antibodies against this spike protein. So when you then, after your vaccination is completed, get an infection, you might not get sick or you might only get mildly sick because when your virus gets into your body, your body realizes that you have seen this protein and you have antibodies against it. So they ramp up antibody production and the antibodies bind to the virus particles and hinder it from infecting your cells. So the infection gets neutralized and you should not get sick or only get mildly sick until the neutralization is complete. Another COVID-19 vaccine that's been used is the one by J&J as a single dose. And that's also only containing the spike protein genetic conformation. Here, the scientists thought of a clever way to package the genetic information into another virus particle that is associated with common cold. But they took out everything that wasn't necessary except for making it a, a vehicle for transport for the spike protein. And so they put the spike protein genetic information as DNA into an adenovirus vector. And so you have the adenovirus vector that does not replicate. It's just a transport vehicle to get the spike genetic information into your body, into your cells. And this has been used um, by Johnson & Johnson, the j, j vaccine, as I said, or and also by AstraZeneca, a vaccine that is approved for use in Europe and elsewhere in the world, but not here yet. And what, um, how this one works is very similar to the mRNA, except there is one more step because the virus particle gets into the cells and the DNA gets into the cell nucleus. And there then the DNA gets transcribed into mRNA and then the same thing happens. The mRNA is in the cell, docks onto ribosomes, the spike protein gets made. Your cells, your immune cells recognize the spike protein as something that's not common or normal in your body. They make an immune response against it. You have antibodies and should you get infected, the antibodies can neutralize the infection. So it's a very similar principle. It's just um, another step. So you might wonder why do we need vaccines? Like what is in general the hype about it? And you know, why can we not just have like a virus like SARS-CoV-2 go through the population until everybody 
gotten infected and has antibodies and immunity through that. Well, there is the problem that none of these diseases are usually, um, you know, not ending up with somebody dying of it. So we really need to protect ourselves and our loved ones, our communities from a potentially lethal disease. I mean, you need to control the spread because in the end, if everybody gets it at the same time, our hospitals and um, doctor's offices cannot handle it. So we would be at the brink of overwhelming the healthcare system. And we have been there almost. I mean, you remember from March 2020, those horrific um, stories from New York City where even hospital ships were um, sent out to help. Or just a month ago in Northern Idaho where healthcare was rationed. So it's really, really um, a problem. And I hear that in Billings right now, the situation is pretty dire. We also um, need to limit the potential drug resistance that can develop um, or the emergence of variants um, when a virus is just loosely spreading through a population. And we really need to protect vulnerable people, including elderly and children. And particularly in regard of the last point, there is a principle that um, public health people have been introducing, and that's called herd immunity. I'm sure some of you might have heard about it, but I really want to go uh, in a little bit more detail about it and um, try to explain what it really means and why it's so important that we have at least 75% of the people um, immune to COVID-19. So, if you imagine in March 2020, people, you were sitting in a classroom, you were at a family gathering, all of you were healthy. However, there might have been a grandma that, you know, was vulnerable or somebody going through cancer treatment um, or a baby. So those are people that don't necessarily have the best immune system. And then there came one person that just had went to China for a business trip and came back and even unknowingly brought the virus with it. And what happens is that the virus spread like wildfire through the entire group. And that's exactly what happened in March 2020. None of us had any immunity against SARS-CoV-2. And um, most of us got infected at some point um, before and, you know, like at, at situations like these, knowingly or unknowingly. However, if there is no pre-existing immunity, like no antibody from a vaccine or somebody that had survived a, a previous infection, a lot of people can end up with serious complications, including death. And that's exactly what happened. Like we had a lot of cases. We had over 500 people in the hospitals, even in Montana towards the end of last year and all of this. So it's it's really serious. In an ideal scenario, it would look different. Like that's what we strive for. Like if everybody is healthy and vaccinated or has survived an infection and then got vaccinated, the vulnerable people after the person comes that is infected are much better protected because only maybe a handful of the people here get infected and have mild symptoms. So this is important here to notice that even if you are vaccinated, you can still get infected and you can still shed the virus, like giving it to others. So no vaccine is 100%. None of the old ones on my lists before were, neither are these. However, you can see that the spread is limited and we are able to protect our vulnerable people. And in general, nobody ends up in the hospital. And this is even more impressively presented here in this little video. I'm gonna run this a couple times because I really would like for you to focus um, on a few separate um, fields here in general. So in black is always one dot where the one infected person comes in. In blue are unvaccinated ones, and in yellow are vaccinated ones, so they have antibodies. So for COVID-19, here this where nobody was vaccinated was March 2020. So, you know, the virus could spread and the disease can spread. 
over here at 50% is where we are right now in Montana in most counties. So look, just if you focus on those two differences while I run it the first time, you can see that there is some, but not a lot. It slowed down the spread, but still a lot of people got infected and it spread rather quickly. You might remember that in the beginning, um, Dr. Fauci and others always said we need at least 70 70 5% of the people to get vaccinated to slow this down. And if you compare this to this, or even the 50% to 75% now, you notice why. The spread is considerably slower and much more limited. I don't even you know, want to go and say, ideally, we would like 90 or 95% vaccinated because I think that is um, not easily achievable. But 75%, I think we can do if we, as a community, we pull together. And this works because um, there has been a lot of recent data in Montana and also in the United States that I want to share some latest findings from you. So COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, so the ones from Pfizer and Moderna, have been shown to protect at least 85% from infection, which means if they were exposed with somebody in the same room that had COVID, they didn't get infected and over 95% did not get into a hospital or died from it. And you can show here that this is really based on data that were gathered in the United States. So this is really encouraging and is really recent and, and from this country. When we look at Montana, though, when it comes to vaccination coverage as a state, we are about the average um, 50% similar to the United States. However, there is a big difference between the age groups, and that is um, really cumbersome. I mean, it's very good to see that some of the most vulnerable people, the older ones, 60 plus, a really good vaccination rate, 75, 84, 79%. And this was recent as of last week. However, there is some age groups that have been affected and where you know people have died that we have less, um, less of the eligible population vaccinated. And that's mainly in the younger ones, children, which I understand, and um, younger adults, which um, is really becoming a problem because those are the people that really, you know, are outgoing and spending time together. And now in the coming winter months, we'll huddle inside more. So we really should make an effort to particularly encourage those to get vaccinated. And if you think, you know, it mainly hits the older people, well, that is true, even though the most cases we have are actually in the younger population between 20 and 29. However, percentage wise in the older people will see many more die of COVID-19 um, compared to the younger. However, also young people die and they don't necessarily need to have an underlying condition. So um, just think about, you know, where you're at and what you can do for your community. I also want to highlight that in the last three months, there most of the people um, that put in with COVID-19 cases in our hospitals, such as stress on the nurses and doctors um, and the entire system are unvaccinated. As you can see here that in from August 7th to October 1st, which is not even two months, there were 1,800 post hospitalizations in Montana and 250 of those died, and 80% of those 250 were unvaccinated, and 83% of just the hospitalizations were unvaccinated. It does not um, say here how many of the breakthrough cases had underlying conditions. So as I said, a vaccine does not protect 100%, but in most cases, it keeps you out of the hospital, which is shown here. I mean, 17% versus 83, that's um, quite tremendous. And then also the hospitalizations are from any age range, from babies up 
to um, people that are 99 years old and people that die are from the early 20s to 100. So it's not just the older, it can also really hit a younger person. For the last few minutes, I want to also point out that the COVID-19 measurements of social distancing, hand washing, and wearing a mask were not just successful in slowing down the spread of COVID-19 in Montana and in the United States, but also against other respiratory viruses. Last week, there was a report that there was not a single flu confirmed flu case in Montana last um, season. And that is actually reflected also in the United States statistics. And you look here from the CDC, every year between 150 and 200 children die of flu, of the real influenza virus A. Last year, last flu season, with all the COVID measures in place, there was one. So it's really not just effective against COVID-19, but against any respiratory virus that transmits through the air. And this is even more pronounced showing here. This is the Montana statistic again. When you look at the season from 2019 to 20, when COVID started, we had in the state 514 confirmed flu cases, which went right along with the five-year average in blue. And there were zero in last year's flu, in last year's um, registration. So that is really remarkable and hopefully really shows everybody that those measures might be worth thinking about in future too when you're traveling or going to crowded places. So I wanna end up with um, a plea of what you can do to make the situation better and hopefully, you know, help getting the situation under control and get us back to at some point soon a normal life where we can freely gather with people again. And the best thing you can do is get vaccinated and encourage others to get vaccinated. Is it your friends or your children or others? Please be aware that there's a lot of misinformation out there about social media, like getting the virus from the vaccine and other things, which is just not true. And if you have any questions about if you should get the vaccine and which vaccine you should be getting, it's always a great conversation to have with your healthcare provider. Any doctor or nurse is usually happy to talk to somebody who's willing to get the vaccine and just doesn't know which one is best for them depending on underlying conditions and other circumstances. Because vaccines are really our most effective health intervention because we can give them to people before they need care and hopefully keep them healthy. I wanna end with a couple more slides about frequently asked questions that I got when I talk about vaccines. And one is I've had COVID-19, should I get vaccinated? And the, the answer is yes, absolutely. Because even though you have gotten COVID-19 and your antibody, as I said in the beginning, uh, your body has seen the entire virus, it's also made antibodies against all these proteins, which is helpful. But in order to prevent a bad infection, again, you really need spike antibodies. And it's the easiest thing to do is getting one of the vaccines that will boost specifically your spike specific antibody response and hopefully prevent protect you from um, reinfection, which in case of the mRNA vaccines, we have seen um, in greater than 85% of the population it does. Another important topic is right now the whole booster conversation. So if you have gotten the Moderna or Pfizer two shots six months ago and you're older than 65, you can get a booster. And it's definitely a plus to do that because the antibodies, the levels decrease over time. So it's good to get a refresher every so often. And right now it would be the time. For the mRNA vaccines, only people in these groups here can get them, whereas for the Johnson & Johnson, the J&J vaccine that was a single dose, anybody that is 18 years and older can get a booster at this point. And another important thing, you do not have to get the same vaccine again. The, um, the CDC and the FDA just approved that you can get 
any of the authorized vaccines. So if you have questions about that, again, talk to your healthcare provider and figure out what might be your best path forward. And I want to end here and um, have some time, some 15 minutes for questions, should there be any. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you very much, Andrea, for that. I learned a lot. We have um, at least five questions here um, to get us started. So I'm going to start with the one that is kind of related to what you actually just talked about. But um, what are the advantages or disadvantages of getting a booster vaccine that's different from the one that you may have got the first time around? So um, if you, in the end, it doesn't matter because all of them encode spike. However, they're all a little bit different. So they stimulate your immune cells all in a little bit of a different way. So there was a study out there that um, has um, in that was conducted in Europe that has used like something like the AstraZeneca, which is similar to the J and J that gave one dose, or Pfizer, and then for the second dose they mixed, and they saw that the antibody response is was better compared to Pfizer, Pfizer, or AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca. So it can be advantageous because the different vaccines work a little bit different on your immune system. However, a lot of people have concerns. They know they have gotten two times the Moderna and had no side effects. Oh, I'm going to go with Moderna again. That's totally fine. So it's not a big difference. It will probably result in minor differences but um, not in anything that is concerning, that's why it's possible. So it's really your preference. Um, scientifically, you know, we see small differences with mixing and matching, but a lot of people are comfortable just getting what they know and that's fine too. It's not a big difference in the overall outcome. All right, thank you. And this might be a little bit related as well. Um, why do we need to get some vaccinations every year, like the flu, and others are sort of good for a lifetime? Maybe that kind of ties into this booster um, discussion as well. It it does. So for for some vaccines, um, you know, like once you get once in a lifetime, um, the older ones or others where you need only a booster, like every ten years or so, the antibody levels are quite consistent. And also the pathogen, the bacteria or virus is staying very much the same over time. Um, and sometimes, you know, for, with polio, you get a refresher, um, like you get it in like early school days and then again later for tetanus, you get it every 10 years. Those bacteria and viruses are very stable. So we don't need general refreshers. Your antibody still recognizes work against it. Then there's flu and COVID-19. So flu is different. Flu is actually worse than COVID-19. When you think for COVID-19, we have variants, and I think some future boosters will cover variants as well. But for flu, flu is a different, in a way, kind of beast because it's so very variable. So for flu every year, we we might hear of those H1 and 1, H5 and 1, H9 and 7. You know, you hear in the news all these H and numbers. And that is very specific to the currently circulating flu type that's hopefully reflected in the vaccine. But since flu is currently evolving and changing, and it can be H1 and 1 one year, H7 and 9 the next year, H2 and 3 the following, we need a different vaccine to account for that. So it's it's really a very different kind of virus. It has a very different um, genome. It's it, it's very different. So I could get a in, lot into detail here, but I don't want to because it's just confusing if it gets too much. So um, it just let me say there is a lot of variants. If you want to say that to cover with flu, that's why we need an annual booster. Whereas with others, they are many, much more stable. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, our next question here, uh, do the current vaccines work against all the current variants? 
They do, but there is um, a degree of difference in there. So obviously the vaccine always works best against the strain that it was developed against, which is right now for all the vaccines that are approved, the original outbreak strain. The problem is that strain does not circulate in the population anymore. Right now, also in Montana, we have 100% Delta variant circulating. So the vaccine is effective against it, but we see um, more breakthrough, even though not more severe disease or hospitalizations than you look overall. But the right. teams still work, all of them actually. So. All right, thank you. Um, the next one here is, do we have specific data um, for clinical vaccination trials that were done in Montana? Is Montana a part of those and was that data Separate or is it just reported as part of national if we were had vaccine trials here? So I'm not aware that anything here in Missoula, well, at least not like through us was being done, but we are a research facility. That might be something, um, a question that will be much better answered by one of the coming speakers or by the Department of Health and Human Services out of Montana. They would know about that because it has to be registered, I think, with them as well. Um, I don't know of any. Um, it would be cool. I agree to see it like specifically for Montana. Um, it would surprise me, but it's possible because you need a really good clinical setup and workout uh, work up of the samples uh, regularly and quickly. Um, but who knows? Good question. All right, and that's okay if we have questions. We have to defer because we will have future speakers and uh, yes. So maybe we can ask that them. Down, to Joel. That's right. I'll get my list of notes and tell the future speakers you have to answer this. So. <laughs> um, let's see. Next up here, um, I've heard some people are unable to receive a vaccine for medical reasons. What medical reasons cause people to not be able to get vaccinated? Uh, that could be a number of, in term, like also, you know, being um, severely immunocompromised or having a history with um, anaphylactic shock against some of the vaccine components, because as I said, it's not just, you know, the mRNA, there's more to it. Um, so there could be a number of reasons. And that's why it's really good to always check with your healthcare worker, uh, with your healthcare provider before you get vaccinated, if you have any um, history about those things. All right. Next up, what's the difference between being vaccinated or having already been infected when it comes to herd immunity? So um, I can use Europe as an example here. Um, if you had an infection, you have antibodies against spike and other proteins, as I said in that one slide towards the end of my presentation. The antibody level drops over time. And people have found that about after six months, your spike antibody uh, levels in particular uh, probably have dropped under a level from an, a vaccinated person and you are at a greater risk for reinfection again. And that's when they really recommend a boost. So you have some, you probably have them over time at a lower level. And that's why even for COVID-19 survivors, vaccination is recommended. All right, thank you. My, the next question is actually two kind of related questions, so I'll ask them together. Um, the first is, um, I heard that some companies are charging higher healthcare costs for employees that choose not to get vaccinated. Why would that be? And then the second question is, I've heard some health insurance policies won't cover COVID costs. And again, why would that be? Do you have any idea what the logic behind um, those policies might be? Well, if you think about it, a lot of businesses are usually, um, you know, like working with the insurance companies, COVID-19 is very expensive. So if you are a local business that has 100 employees and you have two people normally that are super healthy end up in the ICU for three, four days being hospitalized for five, you rake up a bill of 100 plus thousand that everybody has to cover. So, um, and healthcare, you know, we also, that has gone up um, because of the whole pandemic and, and supply chains. So, 
Healthcare insurances has gone up. Delta Airlines was one of the first examples that came out and said, unvaccinated people are putting our health insurance premiums and the policies at greater risk. So if you are unvaccinated, you have to pay a higher premium because we need to compensate for the additional cost. Another strategy that other companies are going with in order for exactly that reason to compensate for that high COVID-19 related cost is if you are not vaccinated and not doing your part for everybody else, then you sign a waiver where um, it states that should you get sick with COVID-19, the cost is not covered. Everything else is, you know, business, business as usual, but if it's COVID-19, it's on you. And that is really dangerous because there can be a lot of money very quickly. All right, thank you. Um, we only have one more question. Um, and that question is, has there ever been a situation where a vaccine was approved and then years down the road, um, it lost its approval, I guess, and was no longer recommended for use? So I cannot think of any that we have gotten. Um, as I said, the vaccine technology changes. So um, vaccines have been updated, if you want to call it that. Like, for example, flu is a very a good example. The old vaccines were made in eggs. Um, and, and now the newer ones are made in, in tissue culture in the laboratory and then inactivated. So while it's still the same thing, it's different and there was a new approval process. But whenever you make a significant change to something like that, it has to go through a new approval process. Um, I'm not aware of a vaccine having gotten um, approval and that was revoked. But then again, I did not study the FDA database for the last five decades. I went just for the um, overview for the last two. So um, I might have missed something. I'm, I'm sorry if I did, but nothing really comes to mind. All right, and I was just going to say we were done, but we've had one more question come in. Um, so that question is, um, which of the COVID vaccines have used cell cultures in their development? The J and J vaccine is using cell culture because the virus particle that is used as a vehicle is produced in there. Whereas the mRNA, it's just the mRNA, which is synthetically made from its components in the lab and then um, like used with the fatty droplet, the nanoparticle. So um, yeah, the J and J would be cell culture. All right. Well, thank you very much for answering that one. Andrea, thank you for sharing all of your time and expertise today. It doesn't look like there's any more um, questions that have come in. Is there any final comments you wanted to share with us? No, it's just thank you for um, having me today. Let me talk about what I'm really passionate about, like vaccines. I, I love those things. So I hope you all get vaccinated and let's get this pandemic over with sooner than later, please. All right. Well, again, Andrea, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to share your expertise and some of your knowledge with us and um, answer our questions and things. So with that, everyone, um, thank you all for uh, joining us today and for submitting those excellent questions. And again, two weeks from today, we will back, be back with our next speaker in this series. And um, that is going to be Dr. Mariana Carrera, who is a healthcare economist, and she's going to talk about some of the policy side of things around um, subsidies, incentives, and things like that as well. So um, thanks, everyone. Um, have a great day, and I hope to see you back in two weeks.